I want you to kindly hold your Bible in your hand and let's say this out loud and strong together. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. I says you could go, out, go ahead and distribute this book, uh, booklet, uh, Biblical Attitude Towards Work, if you just go ahead and distribute one copy to everyone. Uh, and while they're doing that, just give you an update. This past week, I was in Jammu, uh, just ministering at a, two pastors there. Um, and it was just an amazing experience because we had like about a hundred pastors crammed into one small room or hall. Like, I was like, they're all just packed in. And it's really uncomfortable, you know, the, the seats all kept together. And yet, uh, what encouraged my heart so much was the way these pastors were so attentive to the Word of God, receptive to the Word of God. Um, got to minister to them, serve on... Uh, uh, topics like uh, fulfilling a God-given vision, just try to encourage them to have a big vision, receive a vision from God and pursue it and fulfill it. I uh, spoke to them on equipping the saints, what God is doing in equipping believers for the marketplace and uh, to serve God. I uh, also shared on uh, kingdom building, how we are to be kingdom builders, not just church builders, uh, not just building our churches and ministries, but building the kingdom of God. And so all of that was very well received. God just used it to you know, encourage the, uh, the pastors there in Jammu. And it's just a, a blessing to be there and, 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 and minister to them. All right, this morning we're going to start a series of, uh, of teaching and study together called Marketplace Mandates. I'm calling this series Marketplace Mandates. And uh, we're going to use this book to start our, to do our first message today on God's design for the marketplace. Those of you watching us online, uh, you could go to our church website, apcwo.org, click on the link that says publications, and you'll get a listing of all our publications. Towards the, on the right column, towards the lower end of the right column, you'll find, a, find this book available in PDF form, Biblical Attitude Towards Work. You can download that right now, and you can follow along for those of us watching online. Um, Please turn in your Bibles first. Let's begin with, by going to Isaiah, the 28th chapter. Isaiah chapter 28. If you brought your Bibles, kindly turn with me to Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah says, Whom will he teach knowledge? Whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk. Those just drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little. There a little. Isaiah is telling us how God teaches His people. He says, you know, who is God going to teach people? Uh, whom is God going to teach knowledge? Whom is He going to give instruction to? And uh, He kind of likens the way God teaches to the way little children learn. He says, God will teach people this way. Line upon line. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Meaning, when God teaches us, He gives us, you know, gives us the, the, the full package little by little. He doesn't come and Give it all to us and say, here, I've taught you. That's it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I won't see you again on this subject anymore. No, it's line upon line. Precept upon precept. Little by little is how God imparts knowledge, understanding, and instruction into our lives. 
The reason I want to point that out is because we've talked on this subject of the marketplace several times before. Uh, and we've, you know, addressed it from many different angles. And then you're saying, okay, again, we're going to talk about the marketplace. Another four or five Sundays talking about the marketplace. Why are we doing that? Because, you know, I think we will all agree that maybe the first time you hear a teaching on a certain thing, you get one line. And like, oh, that's, that's kind of nice to hear. Yeah. But it all doesn't soak in. And then we tend to forget. And uh, we forget what we've heard concerning the marketplace. And then we, the second time we hear, maybe our understanding grows a little bit. And say, yeah, that does make sense now. The third time you hear it, say, well, it does make, it, it, I see me in it. It's part of what I'm supposed to be doing. And the fourth time, you begin to engage with it and you begin to say, yeah, I, I can see how to apply it in life and so on. So we need to keep coming back to the subject and learning about our place, in, uh, in, uh, our position in the marketplace and, and what God wants for us in the marketplace. So even though for many of us, you may have heard me teach on this several times before, and by going through it again, don't tune off. Amen? It's line upon line, precept upon precept, little over a little, small additions, and until we get a full understanding of what this is all about. So we're going to talk about the marketplace mandate for the next several Sundays. Uh, this morning... We're going to talk about God's design for the marketplace. And we're going to use this little book here. Uh, and if you can follow along with me, uh, I'll just give you the, a reference, the chapters and the page numbers so that we can all uh, go, over the, go through this together. The first thing that we must understand when it comes to God's design for the marketplace is really be convinced that work is God's idea. You know, many of us believers have all kinds of wrong conceptions, or I should say misconceptions concerning work. What we do as professionals, being in business, being in the industry, whatever profession or vocation you might be in. Whether an engineer, a scientist, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, a lawyer. <laughs> Leave them aside for the moment. Uh, a politician. Whatever vocation you might be in, we must be convinced that work and what you are doing is really God's idea. It's interesting to see in the Word of God that in creation, the Bible says, you know, in this one, the first chapter, page one, after God made everything, He saw that it was good. And the Bible says in Genesis 2, that once God did everything, He rested from all His work. So even God worked. The creative act of God was really God doing work. And He said, I need to take it easy for now. Just rest a bit. And later on when God formed Adam and put him in the garden, some of us, we think that all Adam had to do was to sing three choruses every day. One in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. Keep God happy. And that's what, that was it. But that's not true. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, right there on page 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So when God put Adam in the garden, he didn't say, Adam, all you got to do is sing and pray. No. He said, Adam, I'm putting you in the garden and I'm giving you responsibility. You've got to tend the garden. The Message Bible says to work the ground. The literal meaning of that word, tend, means to cultivate. You've got to cultivate the garden. And you've got to keep it, guard it, protect it. Understand this, that God instituted work... Before he instituted marriage. Amen. It's in the Bible. God instituted work. He designed work for Adam. He said, Adam, you've got to cultivate the ground. 
you got to work the ground. you got to protect this garden. And he hadn't yet told him about finding a helpmate suitable for him. That came later. Work was instituted by God. Therefore, work is a God-ordained activity. Some of us think like work, oh, this is such a worldly thing. No, 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 no. It's a godly thing. Work was instituted by God. It's a God-ordained activity. Therefore, let me say these statements that might shake your theology. Number one, work is sacred. So what do you mean? Work is sacred? Yeah, because God designed it. Amen? And let me shake your theology again. Work is ministry. So what do you mean? I thought preaching the Bible, praying for people, that's ministry. How can you say work is ministry? Why? What is the definition of ministry? Ministry is doing anything God ordained you to do. And if God ordained us to work, then work is ministry. If you agree, say amen. If you're not sure, say I don't know. <laughs> work was instituted by God. It's sacred. It's ministry. It's something God wants us to do. Amen? So if you have a new definition of ministry, ministry is basically doing what God wanted, wants you to do. Somehow we've got the idea that, you know, the only preaching and teaching and praying, that's ministry. But your work, look at it as a God-ordained activity. God designed it. God instituted it. It's holy. It's sacred. It's as unto the Lord. It's your ministry. They may not call you reverent in your workplace, but you're still doing ministry. Amen? So work was instituted by God before the fall. You know, some of us think, well, it's because of the fall we have to work. I wish Adam, Adam hadn't eaten that apple or something, you know. But it's not because of the fall. Work was instituted before the fall. What changed in the fall? When Adam and Eve sinned and God pronounced his verdict on, uh, uh, as a consequence of that sin, in Genesis, the third chapter, you read that God cursed the ground. And said, now this ground is going to bring thorns and thistles. And Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to cause this ground to produce. That's what changed. He had to work the ground before the fall and after the fall. What changed was that the ground was cursed. So now he had to put in twice as much effort to bring out the same results. Because of the fall. Are you with me? He had to work before the fall. But we also know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when He came to die on the cross, He came to redeem us from the fall, which includes this thing. So as a believer, we can expect redemptive, the redemptive process of God, the redemptive power of God, even at our work. Our work for a believer, your workplace is redeemed. Because your workplace was affected in the fall, it became cursed. The cross redeems everything that was cursed. Your workplace is redeemed by the cross. Amen? So when you go to your workplace tomorrow, whatever you're doing, some of you are students, you're preparing for the workplace, you're, you're working towards your degree, you're planning to enter into something. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it, you know, ministry also, that's that, is, that is included in what we're talking. Whatever you're preparing yourself for, your workplace is redeemed by God. It's affected and touched by the power of the cross. Amen. Now, as believers, we tend to have wrong attitudes towards work. This is on page 3, chapter 2. Here are some wrong attitudes many of us have as believers towards our job, towards what we do Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. Some of us look at work as a hindrance. Now these are wrong attitudes, so we've got to change them. We look at work as a hindrance. Man, if I didn't have to go to office 9 to 5, I could pray two more hours. 
and uh, I could go house visiting and I could, you know, preach and do all that. So either unconsciously or sometimes we vocalize it, for us, our work has become a big hindrance to what we feel God wants us to do. But that's a wrong attitude. We'll talk about how to look at it, look at our workplace differently in the next chapter. There's another wrong attitude many of us have towards our workplace. We look at work as bondage. You know, when I go to work, I have to report to all these bosses who drive me like a slave. And then my organization has all these rules, policies, procedures. Do's and don'ts. And so, I feel like a slave. After all, in Jesus, I am free. So why should I put up with all this? Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So I don't listen to any boss. Forget about these operating procedures and policies and guidelines at work. I'm a free man. And so we look at our workplace as really an enslavement, a bondage. And that also is a wrong attitude towards work. We must understand that authorities in our lives, whether including those in, at the place of work, and the rules and the policies and the procedures are all put, put in place for a purpose. They help us develop discipline, but they also help the organization function better so that we can bring out, we can achieve more together. That's why they are there. And we must stop looking at them as a threat to our liberty and our freedom in Jesus Christ. But instead, understand that we are actually developing discipline as we submit to those in authority over our lives. For some of us, we see work as a necessary evil. You know, I have to do this so that I can pay the bills every month. If I didn't have any bills to pay, I wouldn't be doing this. So for us, work is like a necessary evil. You have to do it because you got bills to pay. That's a wrong attitude. And then sometimes we tend to push this a little too far. And we begin to look at work as worship. Where we think like, okay... I don't have time for God on Sunday. I don't have time for God during the week. I have no time to worship God. God, just whatever I do for work, please take it as my worship. Now that's also wrong. And as much as God, uh, that work is a God-ordained activity and God wants us to honor Him with it and serve Him with it, God also wants us to worship Him personally, individually, privately. He wants that time with Him. So we cannot substitute our work as in place of our personal devotion and worship to God. We can't do that. We shouldn't do that. But what should a believer's perspective of work be? This is chapter 3, page 6. What should we, what is the right attitude, right perspective of work? I want to challenge you with these thoughts here. See your work as a vehicle, as a means to fulfill the purpose of God, for you to fulfill your life assignment. That through what you do in your place of work, you are actually fulfilling the call of God for your life. See your work, your job, your profession as a vehicle for the purposes of God, for the kingdom of God. Amen? The second right attitude or perspective you and I as believers must have is that our work can indeed become a strategy. A missions strategy or a ministry strategy to further God's kingdom. Now just simple examples. I mean, let's say you work for IBM. I mean, IBM would never invite a pastor to come in. 
and meet all its employees Monday to Friday. Abby would never invite an evangelist to come in there. But you, a sheep in wool's clothing, you are going there five days a week. You are the evangelist. You are the pastor. You are carrying the word of God and the anointing of God into that office Monday through Saturday. And they can't stop you. You're their employee. Amen. So what a strategy for us to represent Jesus in every sphere of society. What a mission strategy for us to send missionaries anywhere and everywhere in all the world. Just make them business people. Make them professionals. And they'll get a key to get into any part of the world. Amen. So you are privileged. See your business. See your place in the marketplace as a strategy, as a mission strategy to expand the kingdom of God. Another important thing, another attitude or perception we must have about our workplace is that really God uses our experience in the marketplace as part of His preparation for our life assignment. You know, what you go through in your place of work, learning to deal with people, learning skills, acquiring knowledge, developing your capabilities, all of this God can use uh, uh, as part of His preparation for you for your life assignment, whatever that might be. So look at your place in the marketplace as a preparation for the call of God and His life assignment for you. And we look at some examples in the Bible. Joseph was a young man. And as a young man, he had a dream that one day his father, his mother, his 11 brothers would bow down and worship, I mean, bow before him. Meaning he would come to a place of such great authority that even his own family members would recognize that. How did it happen? Not because he went to seminary. Not because he became a great preacher. But God took him to a process, placed him, <coughs> excuse me, placed him right next to Pharaoh. He became the prime minister of Egypt. And right there, as a prime minister, he saw the prophetic destiny of God upon his life fulfilled in the marketplace. Think about David. We know David as a psalmist. We read and we sing his psalms. But David didn't sit around singing psalms all day. He was king. He was responsible for an entire nation, for the government, the arm, the military, the economics of an entire nation. And, I, and carrying this great responsibility, he was also a psalmist, a prophet, and a priest to God. Amen? Think about Daniel. We, we know his end time prophecies. Great prophetic utterances about the end times. But Daniel didn't just sit around just prophesying all the time. He was a top man in two empires. First in the Babylonian empire. He rose up politically in the Babylonian empire. And then in the Persian Empire, he became the president. Responsible for the running, the administration of two of the largest empires, one after the other. And then he was a prophet of God. Amen. In the marketplace, he fulfilled his destiny. So I want to encourage you and I. That we must begin to see our role in the marketplace as a vehicle towards our own life assignment, as a strategy for the furtherance of God's kingdom, 
And as part of God's preparation, training, and equipping for our lives. Stay away from the negative attitudes of looking at your work as a hindrance and as a bondage, as a necessary evil. And begin to look at it afresh. In chapter 4, page 10. I want to emphasize that the Bible commands us to work. This is a command from God. Look at some scriptures here. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, Paul says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has needs. So Paul is writing to these believers, you know, they've come out from whatever their past life was. He's saying, okay, some of you guys were thieves. That was the way you made your living. But now, because you're in Jesus, you don't steal anymore. Instead, you work with your own hands so that you can have enough for yourself and also have extra to give somebody else. Motivation to work. Command to work. Work so you take care of your needs and give somebody else. The other interesting thing I want to point out here concerning work is this, you know, we all believe that God is our provider. That God provides for our needs. I mean, He promised it. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Bible says, my God will supply for all of your needs. But do you know that God wants you and me to be part of His method of bringing provision to our own lives? We have the wrong idea that when we say, God will supply for all my needs, then all I need to do is to sit at home and wait for somebody to supply my need. That's a wrong idea. What did Paul say to the Thessalonians here? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, he said that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Why must you work with your own hands? He said, so that you may walk properly towards those who are outside. That means the outside world doesn't look at you and me and say, look, those guys, they don't do anything in life. That we have a good testimony. We walk properly to those who are outside. But here's the second motivation to work. He said, so that you may have lack of nothing. Now put that together with the promise of God that says God will supply. Yes, God said He will supply. But then He also said, you work so that you won't lack anything. Amen? So God's promise to supply all my needs does not eliminate my necessity to work so that I can receive that supply into my life. Amen. So, so some, some, sometimes people say, you know, I live by faith. I have faith that God supplies all my need. Very good. The Bible also says faith works. Amen. Go and do some work. Ministry. Work. Ministry is work. Go work. Do something. Paul said, I want you to work so that you may have lack of nothing. Page 11. In his second letter to the Thessalonians, I think they were like really hard nuts to crack. He had to tell them the second time that they needed to work. And the second time he put it more bluntly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 7 through 12, he says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And he's putting it really hard. He says, guys, if you don't work, don't eat. Finished. So it's pretty strong when it comes to a believer 
taking on responsibility in the marketplace and going out to work. Page 12. Now he takes it even further, writing to the believers in Ephesians, actually, through, to, through Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he says, If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And that's tough. Saying like, look, if you're not going to go to work and earn and take care of your family, it says, you have actually rejected the faith and you are worse than an unbeliever. That's hard. But that shows how serious God is about you and me working. Amen? Now last time I just shared a little bit of my own life and how when I was in my 10th grade, I realized God wanted me to raise up a church in the city of Bangalore to impact the nation. And I was so determined to go to Bible college. But God said, I mean, that door was shut. There was, there was a no. So I had to continue my 11th and 12th. But something very important happened during my 11th and 12th grade. We were part of a church congregation. And, and this may not affect you, but it did me. Sunday after Sunday, we, uh, we'd go to the church and I would see huge crowds of people, maybe hundreds of people coming every Sunday and going back. And they never really did much for God or His kingdom except at attend church on Sundays. And that really bothered me. The pastor was there. He had maybe a few assistants and people to take care of the church. They did all the work. But the laity, the lay people, just laid there. <laughs> Sunday after Sunday. And it really, really bothered me. And it was in my 11th and 12th grade that the second aspect of, of God's purpose for my life was really came to my heart. Something rose up in me and I said, I'm not going to go to Bible college. Instead, I'm going to be like one of them, a lay person, except that I won't lay on the pew. I'm going to be one of those who are going to be a lay person. I'm going to be in the professional world. But at the same time, I want to serve God. And I want my life to model to people how a person involved in the world can also serve God. That gripped my heart in my 11th and 12th grade. So I dropped all idea of going to Bible college. Of course, by the time I'd already started preaching and teaching and ministering. And so since that time, right through, I purposed in my heart that I wouldn't be in what we call as full-time ministry. But I would do what I had to do and still serve God. So through, my, through school, I was preaching and teaching. Through engineering college, ministering. Started working. Uh, when I brought a study, ministering. Continue working, ministering. Doing ministry side by side. With the intent that I want to model with my life that you can be a person who's involved in whatever you're doing in the world, in the marketplace, and still serve God. Amen? So I want to challenge each one of you here. Don't use your responsibility in the marketplace as an excuse for not serving God and doing something for God. See your work as a ministry and through it you say, God, what can I do for your kingdom? A pastor can never come here. I am here. A preacher can never come here. I am here, God. What can I do for your kingdom here? Serve God in your place of work. Amen? Chapter 5, I want us to look at two passages of Scripture that teach us right attitudes towards work. I want us to look at that and we'll wrap up shortly after that. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 10, and also in Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 25, Paul is giving us instructions concerning the workplace. And here's what he says. Now, 
He uses old terminology we can trans as bond servants and bond masters, but we translate it to uh, uh, contemporary English. We call it employees and employers. So let's look at it that way. It says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters or your employers, according to the flesh, meaning in this world, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, as employees of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He repeats this, in a sense, in Colossians chapter 3, three verses 22 to 25. We'll read that. He says, Bond servants or employees, obey in all things your masters, that your employers, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. There are seven things. I mean, we can study, study these passages in detail, but I just want to highlight seven important things Paul tells us concerning God's mandate for the workplace, for a believer. Number one, he says, be obedient to your masters. Be obedient to your bosses. Your supervisors. Be obedient. You know, God wants us to obey those in authority over our lives. Just obey. So, but God doesn't know about my boss. No, He knew. He knows. His word is simply, be obedient to your boss. And not only does He say that, but He goes on, He says, with fear and trembling. That means, those are old English words. In modern terms, you would say, give honor and respect. So that's second attitude. Not only be obedient to your boss or your supervisor, your employer, but give them honor, respect. Say, but I don't feel like it. He didn't say, do it only if you feel like it. This is our mandate in the marketplace. Obey, give honor, give respect. The third thing he says is on page 18 top. He says, whatever you do, do it in sincerity of heart as to Christ. In Colossians he says, in sincerity of heart, fearing God. What you do, do it with the sincerity of heart as to Christ. Do it sincerely. Do it faithfully. Put your heart into it. Be sincere in your work, is what he's saying. And do it, that sincerity is there because you're doing it as unto Christ. Fourth, he says, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bond servants. Bond servants is an old English term, simply means employee. But as employees of Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as employees of Christ. Meaning, is my boss, is my boss watching? Oh yeah, he's watching. <laughs> oh, where is he? Oh, he's gone for a coffee break. Ah. Now I can go to Facebook. <laughs> no. Now I can do what I want. You know. In other words, I do my work only when my boss is watching. When he's not, I don't care. He says, don't work like that. Not with eye service as a men pleaser, but as employee of Christ. Meaning, even if your boss isn't watching, you're not just an employee of him or her, but you're an employee of Christ and he's watching all the time. Amen? That's the way 
we're supposed to work as believers. Number five, he says, doing the, doing the will of God from the heart. Or in Colossians, he says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Meaning, put your whole heart into it. You know, you can tell when somebody is doing something half-heartedly. They kind of drag their feet. They're looking at the clock every time. When it's going to be five. When can I get out of this place? I mean, their heart's not in it. But he says, as a believer, in the workplace, in the marketplace, that's not how we're supposed to work. He says, we out there, we got to work heartily as to the Lord. Put your heart into it and do it for the Lord. Amen? Number six. In Ephesians, he says, with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. With goodwill. The Message Bible, this is on top of page 19, puts it, this like, puts it like this. And work with a smile on your face. Always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. With goodwill, do service. So your boss comes to you and says, are you working on it? Maybe. When will you get it done? I don't know. I'll let you know when I'm done. <laughs> I mean, that's not doing it with goodwill. It's not doing it with a smile on your face. But Paul says, when we're out there as employees of Christ in the marketplace, what you do, do it with goodwill. Make it pleasant for people to work with you. With a smile on your face. As to the Lord. And lastly, and this is important. In both Ephesians and Colossians, he says this. He says, whatever good, in Ephesians he says, whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. In Colossians, he says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. This is very interesting. He's saying, when you go out there in the marketplace and you're working, God is going to reward you. You know, most of us think, well, if you are a preacher... You're a prayer warrior, you're a worship leader. Yeah, those ones will get nice rewards. But me, I'm in business. I'm in entertainment. I'm in arts. I'm a school teacher. I mean, I'm in the secular world. What reward God's going to give me? Change your thinking. The word of God says that for those of us in the marketplace, our reward will come from the Lord. God is going to reward you for what you do in the marketplace. Just as what he might reward a preacher for his preaching, a worship leader for his worship leading, a prayer warrior for his prayers, God will reward you for what you do in his name, for his sake, in the marketplace. But do it the way God wants you to do it. Amen? There are rewards for you. Whatever industry... Whatever sphere of society you may be engaged in or business you might be engaged in, this reward for you. But do it the way God wants you to do it. And you'll receive your reward in the marketplace. There are promises that God has given us for the workplace. Let's look at some of them and close after this. Page 21. God has promised to bless us in all the work of our hands. That was when he says when you go to work, whatever you, you do, he will put his blessing on it. And it's the blessing of the Lord that brings increase, prosperity, and success. That turns impossibility into possibilities. The blessing of the Lord on the work of our hands. Second, God has promised to promote us. He said He'll make us the head and not the tail. Psalm 75, He says, exaltation, promotion comes from the Lord. He knows how to make place for you. Move somebody else out and so he can move in. You move you in. Promotion for, comes from the Lord. So in the marketplace, you want to rise up. You want to increase. 
God says He'll promote you. That's a promise. He's also given us the promise that we will enjoy the fruit of our labor. So as you work hard, doing what you're doing, God promises that you will enjoy the good of your labor, the fruit of your labor, the outcome of it. You can enjoy it. That's God's promise for us. Amen? Now, because work is a God-ordained activity, what you and I must understand is that there is an anointing for it. God has an anointing for everything that He ordains, for every activity He ordains. So there's an anointing for the marketplace. For whatever you're doing, there's an anointing. I want to close with this verse of Scripture. We go back to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, we'll look at verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 28, verses 5 and 6. It says here in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, verses 5 and 6. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. In other words, God is going to decorate his people with his own glory and beauty. But how, are, how is he going to do this? Verse 6. For a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment. And for strength to those who turn the battle back, turn back the battle at the gate. Meaning, God himself will be that anointing for the person who is a judge or a lawyer. God himself will be the anointing for strength to him who is a soldier. What I understand here, God is saying, I'm going to display my glory and my beauty upon my people. How? By being the anointing, the strength and the empowering in their lives right where they are. For the judge, I will be the anointing for justice. For the soldier, I'll be his strength to do a great work at the gate and defend the city. So whatever you're doing, God says, I'll be an anointing to you in that. And through that, I will display my glory and my beauty on my people. This year we said His glory will be seen upon us. His glory will make the difference. How is God's glory and beauty going to be seen upon you and me? Like this. In your place of work. Whether you're a judge or a soldier, or you're a businessman, your teacher, a nurse, a doctor, whatever your vocation may, may be, whatever your sphere of influence may be, right there, He becomes the anointing for you. He becomes the empowering for you. And by His work, through you, in your marketplace, His glory and beauty will be seen. Do you believe God will do that? Amen. There is a mandate for the marketplace. This is God's design for us. Next time we're going to continue talking about this. We're going to talk about God's anointing for the marketplace. That there is really a working of the Holy Spirit. Whatever work, whatever sphere of influence you might be. You might be a designer, graphics designer. You might be an artist. You might be a politician. Whatever. There's an anointing, an empowering of the Holy Spirit that comes to you for that. You must become aware of it and begin to tap into it and make demands on it because that's how God's glory and beauty is going to be revealed through His people in this world. Let's rise to our feet. Let's call the worship team up, please. This morning, I would like us just to take a moment to pray before God and say, Lord, I want to embrace my call to the marketplace. Now some of us might be called to what we call as full-time ministry in the sense you dedicate all your time to the preaching, the teaching, the ministering of the word and serving people and, and so on. And that's absolutely valid. I am not discrediting it at all. God calls some of us to do that. And that's a very valid thing to be preachers and teachers of his word and ministers of God. 
But the majority of us will be people who are engaged in the marketplace. We'll be doing something out there. You might be a homemaker and you say like, you know, what can I do for God? There is an anointing there because that is a God-ordained activity. Whatever your vocation is, you say, God, this morning, I want to embrace my call. That in the marketplace, I want to serve your purposes. Would you take a moment just to pray that? It could be a turning point for some of us. For some of us, we're going to leave this place this morning. Going to love what we do Monday to Saturday. Going to enjoy it because we no longer see it as a necessary evil. We no longer see it as a bondage. We no longer see it as a hindrance. But we see it as a vehicle for God's assignment for our lives. We see it as a strategy. We see it as a preparation. We see God's hand in it. We see it as a divine assignment. We're going to enjoy it. So would you just pray and say, God, what have you given me to do in the marketplace? I'm ready for it. I want to be your man, your woman. Your anointed man, your anointed woman in the marketplace. I want to be a Joseph. I want to be a David. I want to be a Daniel. I want to be a Paul. Right here in this office, in this role that you've given me, I want to see your, I want your glory and your beauty to be put on display, God. No preacher can come in here, no evangelist can get here, but I am here. I want to be your man, your woman. I want your glory and your beauty to cover my life here, yeah, God. Would you take a moment to pray? For some of us, maybe we just need God to position us. Maybe we are in transition out of college into the marketplace or getting near there. Maybe a few months from now, you'll be on the market looking for a job. Or some of us are going through other transitions. Maybe changing jobs or things like that. Making career decisions. Maybe even career changes. But it's wonderful in these moments of transition. Just to pray and say, God, would you position me? Would, me, would you put me in the right career? Would you put me in the right place of business or occupation? But I'll do it, Lord, not because it's an evil, something that I have to do as a necessity, but I'll do it as a mission. I'll do it knowing that I'm your man, your woman in that place to show your glory and beauty your wisdom, your ability in that place. Will you take a moment to pray and just ask the Lord to position you. Ask the Lord to guide you, direct your steps into that place He would want you to be. You know, sometimes the way into that place may be hard. The path that Joseph had to go through to get to being prime minister was not an easy path. He had to become a slave. He went into prison, falsely accused. But you know what? Psalm 105 says that the time came when the word of the Lord tested him and when that was fulfilled. He was taken from prison to being the Prime Minister. But once he was positioned, he fulfilled his destiny. Would you take a moment to pray? Say, God, position me. The path into that position may be hard, but God will position you. And you will have impact and influence for His kingdom. You will.
Father, we just pray over your people, each one here this morning, God. That truly by your Spirit, you will grace our lives with your glory and your beauty, God. That whatever place we may have, whatever role we may have, whatever position we may have in the marketplace, that we will occupy it with confidence. And that through our work and through what we do and the way we do what we do your glory and your beauty will be seen upon our lives I pray God for a release of anointing on everyone those already in the marketplace and those who are being prepared for and being positioned that the Holy Spirit will empower each one of us to be mighty men and women of God in the world. In the world. In the corporate offices. In media. In arts. In entertainment. In sport. In education. In government. In every sphere of society. Anoint your people. Raise them up in positions of power and influence. Let your excellence, let your wisdom come through God in every work that they put their hands to. And may we see your kingdom come, your will be done through each one of your people, Lord God. Father, we just pray for grace. We pray for your anointing on those who might be facing challenges, obstacles, hindrances in the marketplace. We come against every demonic hindrance, every 
demonic assignment to hinder their call to hinder their ministry to hinder their work in the marketplace and today by the anointing of God we tear down every demonic assignment we tear down every demonic stronghold we pull down every demonic hindrance and we declare that God's people will march forward by the anointing of God will triumph in the marketplace in their job in their vocation and whatever they do they will advance they will see increase by the anointing of God they will fulfill their ministry their life assignment in the marketplace not no devil from hell no man on earth can stop their advancement can stop their furthering the kingdom of god in the marketplace father we ask for doors to open up for those who might be facing closed doors we ask for favor to come on those who worked hard and are waiting for promotion We ask for increase and blessing upon the work of our hands. Let growth come. Because God, you're with us, you're for us. We are employees of Christ. We are your employees. And God, your word says that we will receive our reward from the Lord. Thank you that you reward each one, Lord. We thank you. We bless you. And we honor you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close. Arise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people yet the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you in Jesus name Amen. Amen God bless you you are an employee of Jesus go out to the marketplace make a difference God bless you first time visitors if you could make your way to the hallway towards the left our visitors welcome team will be there to meet you God bless you have a great week